All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest Urban Living webinar uh, in this series sponsored by Flywire. Today's session is all about entrepreneurs, and we're going to be talking to three entrepreneurs with very different backgrounds in different disciplines across real estate and hospitality. Um, we're going to talk about how um, the pandemic has affected their businesses, the, the opportunities and the challenges it's presented, and how they're looking to the future. My name is George Sell. I'm Editor-in-Chief at International Hospitality Media. And we are an online publisher of B2B news sites for the hospitality industry, and we're also an events organizer. Now these sessions are sponsored by Flywire. Flywire is a global payments enablement and software company on a mission to deliver the world's most important and complex payments. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about them, you can see some contact details in the chat and their web address is displayed on your screen now. So this webinar is going to last an hour. Uh, we'd like to make it as interactive as possible. So after our Q&A, um, we'd love you to submit your questions using the Q&A uh, function in Zoom. Um, we're going to probably have 10 minutes or so to get around to Q&A at the end. Everybody who is registered for the session will receive a recording via email in the next couple of days. So we've got a great panel of entrepreneurs joining us today, and I'm going to ask the three of them in turn to give us a bit of background to their careers and then to the companies that they have recently founded and they're working at now. Um, and I'll go from left to right as we see you on the screen. So, uh, Laszlo, welcome to you. Would you like to kick off, please? Yes, hi there. Um, yeah, so originally I, I'm from Budapest, Hungary. I was trained as an architect in London at UCL. Um, and then during a number of years, I worked as an architect in London, Barcelona, Zurich, several countries across Europe. Um, and then eventually I went client side and became an executive at Google. Um, so I was working as, my title was campus architect um, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, so I was working on, on sort of the large um, corporate real estate expansion strategies and also execution of, of uh, Google's um, portfolio, basically, We're both mainly in, in California. Uh, in Mountain View and Sunnyvale and around, um, but was also involved in a number of uh, international projects. Um, and then in 2018, I decided to move back to Europe and co-founded together with a, an old Portuguese friend of mine in Lisbon. Um, I co-founded a company called Eden, which is a co-working brand um, in December 2020, so in the midst of the pandemic being in full swing, it's in Lisbon as well, that she closed our first investment round with a Portuguese-Brazilian um, venture capital and, and real estate fund. Um, and now we are, and as part of that, that uh, investment as well, we ended up spinning out another part of the company which is called Spaceworks. So the way we look at it as a team is basically sort of a space experience and curation brand and Spaceworks is the digital space management and design component to that. Um, so we effectively run, run two parallel companies and kind of, you know, look to the synergies and our clients are, you know, increasingly we saw that clients are also looking for not just an immediate offer as a cohort, but also for their helping to define their strategy uh, going forward when they, for example, move to Lisbon from the US or from the UK or elsewhere. So that's, that's me in a, in a nutshell. Thanks, Laszlo. Um, Cindy, would you like to give us some background in, into you and your company, please? Yeah, well, that, um, that's a hard nut to follow. So um, my name is Cindy Diffenderfer. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Orion House. We are an Airbnb or home sharing friendly building uh, property manager and enterprise software solution. Um, my background, I've been in the short-term rental, long-term rental space now for the last six years. Uh, former companies, I would have still an owner but not operator of is Nitivo, um, which is a luxury condo brand also that is uh, short-term rental friendly. Um, and then Nito, which was a partnership with Airbnb. Um, 
prior to that, I actually worked in the hospitality space as on the vendor side. So I had um, a keg wine company, uh, uh, draft beer um, in the craft beer craze. We launched that and exited that um, around 2010. And then prior to that, I was in the fashion industry. So serial entrepreneur, um, but very much uh, ingrained in lifestyle industries that kind of suited where my interests were. Um, and I've really found my passion here and, you know, creating flexible living and working solutions. And, you know, it's afforded me and my family and friends, you know, a nice way to live. And um, we continue to, you know, hopefully expand that so that others could experience the same. Thanks, Cindy. And finally, Leo, over to you. Hi, uh, yeah, we started IMS, myself and my business partner, Shane, started IMS in 2003. Um, and we began offering tech services into student accommodation, would you believe, at the start. That was our first foray into, into managed service, into uh, what, well, it was hardwired at the time, not Wi-Fi. Um, and over the, over the years, we evolved into more hospitality oriented and in most recent times into service departments apart hotels and uh, co-living and build to rent so it's been a very interesting journey um, we now are offering our services uh, throughout ireland the uk and europe uh, we're flying on the coattails of some really good apart hotel operators in particular uh, some of our key clients are in Switzerland, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, as well as the UK and Ireland. Uh, and I guess our mission is to make our customers' lives easier. Our customers being the operators of multi-tenant or multi-family accommodation, and whether it be in traditional hospitality or most recently co-living and built rent areas. Um, yeah, and that's what, that's what we do. Okay, thanks, Leo. Um, let's stick with you for a moment, Leo. Um, as we emerge from the pandemic, albeit more slowly than we would have liked, it's, it's becoming quite a, a drawn out process. What do you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities for your business? Uh, the biggest challenge, it's a good question because the pandemic itself was a, a massive challenge. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, opportun uh, opportunistic for us because it gave us time to reassess and we examined the, the, the markets we were in. We were very heavily focused on hospitality pre-pandemic, and we were just starting to uh, look at the BTR markets and the co-living markets. And we'd signed our first deal for co-living schemes in Ireland, and, uh, and we were negotiating with BTR schemes as well. So it really made us look at uh, diversifying our portfolio. Um, and at the same time, trying to help our existing hospitality clients, we're a Zoom partner, so we put all our put all our uh, management teams right across all the properties on Zoom licenses, so that they could keep keep the ship afloat. Uh, and we pivoted uh, into the health and the education sectors to help them out as well. So it was a really interesting time, and, and we got to know ourselves again, if you like. Uh, and the challenges on the, this side now is, for us, the two main challenges are getting product. Um, it's, it's a real, real challenge trying to get product and staff. Uh, we're seeing that we're trying to recruit uh, and we're having to hold, we're having to stockpile for jobs that are 12 months down the line at the moment. And we're also trying to recruit and the recruitment uh, process, we're finding it very difficult to find staff. So they are the two key challenges because I guess when we came out of pandemic, a lot of projects that we were involved in were put on hold. Suddenly they are going 100 miles an hour. Uh, and those projects, uh, they want them done yesterday. And so we have that product problem, that staffing problem, uh, and just trying not to put too much workload on our staff uh, and our, our current resources while trying to, uh, yeah, trying to get more, basically. So that's, that's the biggest challenge for us. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Um, Cindy, maybe if I can direct the same question to you, that the biggest challenges and opportunities you, you're currently facing. You know, they are shifting constantly, but I will say, you know, early on in COVID, I have to agree and resonate with Leo talking about inventory. We had an enormous pipeline set up, uh, you know, call it February of 2020. 
um, new delivery product, existing inventory that we were converting into the flexible housing solutions. And all of that, even though it was a really big initiative for some of our institutional partners, really got put on the back burner. And they said, look, we are so focused right now on rent collections and you know eviction moratoriums and all the different things that, that occurred here stateside that we can't look at new initiatives of which flexible living and home sharing friendly buildings is really disruptive to the nature of traditional multifamily. So, you know, a year ago, that was really our biggest challenge. Now, um, we have got a massive influx of inventory from our partnership side, uh, institutional, a lot of institutional inventory. We've got a lot of uh, depressed hotel inventory that's looking to convert into multifamily that is, um, you know, uh, under optimized and probably overbuilt in some of these markets. Um, and then we've got massive inbound demand now from consumers that tried uh, vacation rentals during COVID that were traditionally hotel travelers. So now they've opened their eyes and they go, oh my God, this is great. I can get an apartment versus staying in a hotel and I can take my family and we're staying for longer periods of time. So um, you know, it really went from, uh, in this case, famine to feast. Um, so from our perspective, we're spending a lot of time, you know, creating institutional and programmatic solutions that we can onboard uh, large swaths of inventory while still maintaining um, consistency on the customer service and the brand side of the equation. Um, that said, you know, we're rolling out slowly because we've got to, we've got to make it, break it and fix it. Um, as we introduce new buildings and new inventories to each market. So um, it was the hurry up and wait, and now the hurry up and deliver, and uh, everything that kind of, that, that feeds into that frenzy. And are you experiencing similar issues with, with recruitment? I know in the UK and Ireland, it, it's a problem across all sectors. Is that echoed in, on your side of the pond? You know, they have the absolute answer is absolutely yes, right? And it really depends on the sector of which we're hiring. Um, and I hate to use the term unskilled labor, but you know, kind of our hourly employees that are front desk or maintenance or groundskeepers, uh, you know, those people that really make our business run, we find the hardest to employ right now. Um, and we are all speculating as to why. But um, we definitely have a shortage on the supply, you know, for, for hiring on that scope. And then on the flip side, for more managerial and executive level staffing, um, the competition has become much greater. Um, you know, we really have to have a point of difference where it isn't just compensation, where it's quality of living and benefits and flexibility, um, things that people have become accustomed to through COVID. We have to kind of tailor now our job offerings to, you know, the lifestyle that um, people are now enjoying and want to continue enjoying um, and, and meeting a balance there. You know, I mean, we're all about flexibility and home sharing and, and working remotely, um, but, but the pendulum swung a little bit far, you know, where we got people a little too comfortable and they're in the homes and the dogs and the kids are in the meetings and all of that stuff. So right now we're, we've got to get our balance back where it's like, there's got to be a sense of office to form no matter where you are. Um, but yeah, we, we are experiencing all of those, um, the, the, the same challenges, you know, we are, um, largely, well, exclusively America right now. So I know every country has got its own set of challenges, um, from all different, uh, viewpoints, certainly with, you know, how the financial structuring was done for COVID packages and, you know, employment benefits and then, you know, housing concessions and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, we're just navigating the minefield right now to figure out what the world looks like on the other side. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cindy. And Laszlo, does anything that Cindy and Leo have said resonate with you in terms of challenges and opportunities? And are there any additional ones you'd like to bring up? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that, you know, on our end as well, staffing and scaling for, for our business is, is definitely a, a challenge as well because the pandemic. So it's, you know, very much the, the, the exact same things. Obviously, you know, Lisbon is sort of a, a smaller market and a smaller, smaller scale overall what we're doing as well. Um, but yeah, very similar. We also had sort of a, a you know, with the entry also of the investors, we sort of had a a pretty ambitious pipeline and then you know the all of well, then then you have to sort of readjust to the new realities um post post pandemic to that um and then the other thing i would say from our perspective as well is that the 
the kind of the really big challenge as well is also to 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 help the the, the customers who are coming to us of which there is no short supply but really help them redefine this new hybrid right Every, everyone's now starting to use all these buzzwords and they you know they sort of show up on your doors and say like hey what we want is a hybrid work solution what you got and 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 you then you have to make them realize that whatever they mean by hybrid might not be what they've read in the new york times hybrid is or you know so the, there's a lot of lot of that kind of getting down into the weeds with the clients and really helping them reassess their new realities and the reality that they're finding themselves within so i think that's definitely a big challenge as well let's pick up on one of the things you mentioned there which is investor sentiment how have you found investor sentiment to your business and to your your market space in general investment and, and lending has that evolved as, as the pandemic has progressed yeah i mean you know we were again in a sort of very lucky and privileged position we were sort of small enough where we didn't have to sort of have the worries of a we were in the middle of a pandemic but big enough already that we also you know we had in kind of customers and, and enterprise clients who took the long view right so we never had sort of a catastrophic sort of drying up of revenue uh, even at the full lockdown so we sort of knew that we were relatively safe as a business getting through it um including as i mentioned right like actually closing an investment round during the pandemic so i would say that generally you know the sentiment in lisbon is is very positive and very strong because lisbon was also just one of those places that kind of sailed through the pandemic by and large or well the real estate sector i'm sure you know there's a lot of people in certain areas of society who suffered a lot and continue to suffer and there was a lot of repercussions across society and the job market etc but you know real estate specifically just held very very strong in lisbon i think it's one of the top four places in the world um where values just held and you know obviously it's sort of reflected in also our, our our business and then you know what you're finding you know the minute sort of the full lockdown was over demand is kind of through the roof you know it's right back to where it was even bigger but now more complex and more diversified which you know goes back to that point that now you really need to be sort of a, a, a true partner to the client to 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 help them define what they really want from a from a workspace right it's not it's, it's no longer a given that it's an office and a desk and a chair and there you go like <laughs> that's it right you really need to kind of hold their hand or or, or sort of co-create with them the experience and the actual sort of service offering and the product that you're that you're selling to them because they have a lot you know everyone has just a lot more questions that dig a lot more deeper you know there's a lot of sort of existential rethinking for the companies themselves and that gets reflected back to how they they interact with us and how they talk to us we'll come back in a minute to talk about how you've had to reevaluate your offer and what clients are asking for but first i just want to ask cindy what your experience has been of um your conversations with investors and and how how they've seen the pandemic progress and, and their confidence in, in in your sector and your model it's been a mixed bag um you know i mean there was there was so much concern around the master lease short-term rental business model with companies like the Guild and Sonder and Stay Alfred and Lyric and all these guys that have a lot of inventory with a lot of liability on it. And so immediately when that demand dried up, unlike Laszlo's uh, commercial clients, these are, these are consumer clients who are going in and just not traveling anymore. Um, and they had this massive burden of those lease obligations. So there was a real fear as many of those companies started just falling off, right? They couldn't service the debt. They couldn't service their leases. They, had, they, they were in a very strong financial position at the beginning of the pandemic. And then everything just was brought to a, to a standstill. Um, so, you know, investors were scared, quite frankly, to look at short-term rentals, much like the hotel institutional capital where they go, you know, hotels also are a victim of circumstance when it comes to uh, the seasonality as well as the pandemics and then the mandates from the government position. Um, you know, Airbnb, I have to give them an enormous amount of credit for how they handled both their travelers and their host community and how they rebounded from pulling the IPO and then going out and really soaring and, and building that investor confidence and consumer confidence again. Um, you know, now everybody's looking at it with 
it, with a little bit of uh, a conservative view saying, well, what if this happens again? And we're in a unique position that we aren't reliant exclusively on short-term rental income. You know, the first source of revenue that our company earns is from the monthly rent payment, of which rent collections maintained at 92 to 98% across America. So because we, we first collect rent and then secondarily um, allow those residents to do short-term rentals, um, our increased net operating income, that bump comes from the short-term rental piece. So we've got a much more stable business model, uh, but we still kind of get bulked into just a traditional short-term renter. Um, so, you know, there, there was that kind of conservative standpoint. Um, now, you know, we just actually closed around um, with some really strong investors that are hospitality and multifamily focused, um, you know, they don't have the same level of fear as traditional venture capitalists, where you're looking at these crazy valuations that come tumbling down and, you know, the, the volatility, um, you know, that buzz can create versus the stability that revenue um, maintains from, from an institutional multifamily perspective. So, um, you know, we, we went private equity um, and institutional capital versus venture capital, which is, um, had, has been a strength for us. Um, in that, but but I would say you know there was there was so much uncertainty. Airbnb just did an enormous favor, I think, to the entire short term rental industry by really handling um, the pandemic well and, and coming out swinging and better and stronger and faster than all. And, and I think that trickle down effect impacts us all really positively. Mm -hmm. And as well as your investors, how have conversations been with building owners? Have they become more receptive to your model because you do have those twin income streams? So the answer generally is yes. Um, and then the second piece is once they kind of get familiar with the business model, which we do underwriting and we do um, design and you know software and technology and hardware integrations and all this stuff that kind of makes things work. Um, the thought becomes, well, can I just do this myself and not pay for it? So, you know, there's, there's the, the smaller guys that go, oh, we absolutely can't do this. But the, the more institutional partners kind of want to look up our skirt, figure out how it's done, and then replicate it, which we haven't yet seen great success in, but no doubt they will thrive. Um, but, but the interest level is certainly there. You know, the demand from the consumer is pushing them a lot faster than I think they'd like to move on their own. Um, but certainly, you know, the upside on the NOI is a key driver for the institutions. They get that, um, you know, so a uh, lot, of, lot of demand, a lot of um, dating. And, but, our, but our better partners are smaller groups. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Leo, you're obviously coming at this from a slightly different angle as a supplier to real estate and hospitality. How have the financial institutions that you deal with been through the course of the pandemic, whether it's lenders or, or investors or, or whoever? It's been really interesting, uh, George, because I guess in comparison to the recession uh, of 2008 to 2010, this, this is a walk in the park in, in terms of lending investments because uh, there hasn't been a slack of in lending and investing. Whereas during recession time, coming out of the recession, it was a very different story. So what we're seeing is a lot of projects put on hold, but the fi but already financed are in the process of being financed and ready to go as soon as the world opened up again. So we saw a fairly healthy, uh, fairly healthy attitude to investment um, coming out of the pandemic. And then I guess anecdotally, in terms of our clients who took um, uh, the opportunity to upgrade their facilities during the pandemic, particularly in the hospitality world. So we were kept very busy with upgrades of tech uh, that was probably overdue in certain uh, in certain hospitality groups. But they took the there was a real um, a real openness to invest, uh, knowing that they come out strong once the pandemic was over. So the comparison between recession and pandemic has been really interesting for us. Mm -hmm. And are these upgrades possible while a building is trading piecemeal or are these properties that were forced to close and, and decided to take that window of opportunity to, to, to 
get the, get the work done. Mostly closed properties on the traditional hospitality front uh, chose to upgrade. A lot of a lot of our clients would have been maybe due an upgrade uh, and had just been slow about upgrading tech. You know the way that sometimes they like to sweat the asset, uh, whereas we would like them to continuously every five year cycle. To tech uh, in terms of Wi-Fi for sure uh, needs to be upgraded. So um, yeah, it was very easy to upgrade then during close when the when those hotels were closed for business. It's also important, I guess, in the hospitality sector, there was a lot of financial uh, help given uh, by the by governments as well. So they weren't under as much pressure as you would imagine they might have been. Um, and therefore they, they were in a position to come out strongly. Um, and then in terms of the, the apart hotel sector, of course, the apart hotel sector and service apartments were just booming. And what we saw there was um, the, the, the need, uh, and it's funny listening to the guys, that the change in attitudes, change in usage, change, if you take internet, for example, the bandwidth usage in, a, in a, an apartment block has gone through the roof of work from home and hybrid working. So there's been a real reality check as well amongst the operators to say, listen, this is what we need to give our people now. They're no longer just uh, checking email or, or looking at Facebook or, or watching Netflix. They're now full on on conferences, uh, on college, kids at school. Um, Everything needs to be perfect from, in terms of connectivity. So it's been fairly easy for us then. The conversation has been had by the world. It's fairly easy for us to go to one of our groups and say, you need to upgrade all your connectivity across the group up to this level as a given. Once you do that, then you can cater for every every eventuality. So that's uh, the need for investment is clear there as well. Thanks, Leah. Laszlo, let's come back to you and talk about <clears throat> how changing ways of working might have forced you to reevaluate your offer to clients. Um, you know, when, when, a, when a new company comes to you looking to take workspace, uh, is their wish list very different from what it was a couple of years ago? Uh, yes, it definitely is. Um, I'd say the main main change, which I already alluded to previously, is that there is a lot of new clients who previously have wouldn't even have contemplated co-working right it's 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 uh, you know very, very similar to what leo just described as well where where basically it, we, it, this hasn't really changed the paradigm of where where the trajectory was already going but it certainly accelerated things probably by five to ten years or even more uh, right so so there's a lot of uh, companies now and, and enterprises who might have in five or ten years time started to think about co-working and or some type of sort of shared office space and some kind of hybrid solutions and and suddenly this has become a, an immediate reality for them um so so that's you know clear being one one part and then hand in hand with that goes again a sort of diversifying and sort of a, a kind of new level of complexity to what their demands are and what their needs and requirements are relative to how they want their workforce to interact whether within their own spaces and also in shared spaces that they're in. Um, and again, this is where sort of, you know, this split and this kind of spin out of space works also, this, this is why it came about because we, we started to understand that there's a lot of clients who are coming to us with a, with a, with a much more, um, Kind of you know with a with a with a much more kind of refined and redefined need uh, rather than just hey I need workspace for whatever sixty people do you guys have enough desks available kind of thing right they they immediately come with 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 a request that goes hey we need workspace in Lisbon for sixty people in the next six months um, and then we'll have to reevaluate and from a year and a half from now we might be opening up our own offices how can you help us right so it's, it's a much more open-ended conversation um, now with them and have your experiences and learnings from the pandemic changed the way that you will design future buildings i don't know what, what is your pipeline for openings and how will they differ from from your existing building yeah, I mean, to be honest, we have even pre-pandemic, we were always betting on quality over quantity, just to put it a little bit crudely. 
and you know, I mean, there is this level of sort of right per square meter per per person, desk sizes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that you know, that's where where, where co workings also differ a lot in the offering of what sort of the level of design that you put into it, what's the level of design thinking, and what what uh, kind of level of occupancies you're basically trying to drive within your your portfolio, right? So what we've been doing pre-pandemic already was always erring on the side of actually being more generous, providing more open spaces, more circulation, wider corridors, all of this good stuff. Um, so to be honest, actually, the pandemic hasn't really impacted anything significantly. We've been, you know, we've just kind of carried on where we sort of left off. And, and indeed, you know, on most of our spaces, we didn't really have to intervene in any significant way where, you know, there was a lot of co-working space that suddenly went like, wow, we have to completely redo the desk sizes. We have to rethink the layouts. We need to completely redo what we've been doing. So again, luckily, we sort of were always always kind of heading in a direction where, where we, you know, not that we ever expected such an eventuality or pandemic to hit, but sort of just naturally. And again, this is also based on my long experience working in in this field and commercial real estate and working at google as well we obviously there was a lot of number crunching of how many square meters per person you should be having across a portfolio that was you know millions of square feet across the world and let's say you know i've kind of learned learned my lessons along the way and and, and was always focused on, on on quality with what we were doing as at Eden. And it's obviously um, a pretty lively building where you are now. We can see, we can see and hear people moving. Yeah, it's pretty packed, actually. Yeah. I'm happy to sit here, actually, because all our rooms are taken. So I just... uh, that's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, so what do you offer in terms of, of communal spaces that, that, that aren't strictly workspace? You know, it's sort of the, the, the usual, usual amenities. We have sort of, a, you know, I can sort of swing the camera around, but we have kind of, you know, sort of a kitchen and breakout space. We have sort of the eating space, the, the ping pong table behind as an event space. So, you know, I would say sort of in, in the kind of very big picture, the way I look at it is that what the pandemic has, has really fostered and accelerated is this already ongoing convergence between commercial real estate between hospitality and events specifically, right? So in this this sort of whole new reality where it's not a, a given what the office is really there to do for, for, for any given company, right? People are really rethinking this and the office has become much more of a sort of, you know, gathering space and a coming together space more than, than necessarily just a sort of sitting at your desk and, and being there for, you know, eight hours or however many in front of a screen and a computer. Um, and I think there, there is, you know, a lot of stuff that we, you know, luckily intuitively already got right before the pandemic that our space is pretty naturally sort of uh, converged in, in this direction or converted into this sort of new rea reality. Uh, but I'd say this is sort of the, 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 you know, it's kind of an ongoing daily almost conversation as well for the, the spaces that they've in the pipeline as well. But again, I would say, you know, in summary, we haven't really changed anything dramatically and didn't have to rethink because we're already sort of on this path and, and going in this direction before. And just quickly, for the benefit of those of us who are shivering in a grey northern Europe, can you show us the view of the other side? Oh, yeah, just uh, you want to look at the, look at the river front. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty sunny out here, yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you, Laszlo. Um, Cindy, the, the rent-to-rent model, if you want to better term, is what terminology you use, but, um, and you can, you can correct me if that's an inappropriate one, but it's, it's a really interesting new concept. Are there any legislative barriers to it in the States? And if so, do they vary regionally? I, I know in a lot of buildings, um, here, here in the UK, sub, it would be termed subletting and, and it, it wouldn't be allowed, but I get the impression things are freeing up a bit now. What's the situation with you? Okay, that's a very loaded question. Um, lot, a lot of answers in that, but yeah, there is a lot of legislation that's around it. Um, generally, in more densely populated areas like in New York and in San Francisco, um, Chicago, they'll have density caps on it saying, okay, only 25% of this building can participate in short-term rental activity. Um, and, and generally when that's written, it's targeted to maintain the affordable housing inventory so that people aren't taking these leases just for the sole purpose of running them as short-term rentals to do that, you know, quote unquote, rental arbitrage. Mm -hmm. uh, our business is set 
that we go only into markets that and and zones that we can actually operate. Um, and cities like New York were just no goes basically, unless we went into something that was already a hospitality or a condo hotel product. That is changing now. Not that my company is going to approach it anytime soon, but the city itself, because there's just an enormous surplus of commercial, both retail and office space that is now sitting dormant and being repurposed and trying to figure out like what its next life is going to have. Um, you know, the city's starting to look at that in different ways. Like, could we turn that into flexible office and or living and or whatever? Um, but traditionally up until COVID, the answer was absolutely no, right? Anywhere there was a shortage of affordable housing, they really wanted to maintain that inventory dedicated exclusively to annual rentals. Um, outside of those real dense populated areas, we've got a lot of flexibility. So, you know, what we've experienced through COVID is that America became a driving vacation community. So people were still vacationing. They just weren't flying to those destinations. So they were going for longer periods of time and they were going to mountains and coastal communities and lakes and things of that nature. And those communities really embraced the short-term rental uh, and long-term rental business models because they were impacted so much through seasonality. So the idea of being able to get your annual rent plus your high season peak rates is really attractive. Um, our geographic strategy has been focused primarily along coastal cities throughout the southeastern corridor of the United States. Um, as you well know, this country is just huge, so you can drive for 20 hours and still be in the same state. Um, so we really focus on those areas that had really been impacted seasonally, um, but had the demand now, you know, through relocation and from longer term stays and from flexible working, um, that, that that inventory was being absorbed year round. Um, so I think legislation will catch up. You know, it's really written to tell you what you can't do versus what you can do. Um, from the building owner's perspective, it's typically ingrained in the lease and that's where that restriction comes from. Um, it's not necessarily dictated by the municipality. Uh, in some cases it is, in other cases it's not. So it really, you know, um, loaded question because every single building in every city block is really is zoned and treated differently. And do you, uh, do you restrict how many nights your customers can, can dedicate their units to short term rentals, your, your year round clients? Yep. Uh, and are you seeing any trends in that direction? What, what, what is the average? Um, so we've got, it, it, it depends on the building. So we've got buildings that are really prime for short-term rentals, meaning there's an appreciable difference between the amount of rent that they're paying on a monthly basis and what the potential earnings are on the short-term rental basis. So those are the markets that what we call professional hosts want to lease in. So we'll dedicate a certain amount of inventory, call it eight or 10% for professional hosts. The remaining 90% of our inventory would be uh, allocated to primary residents. But it really depends on that travel demand because you're paying $3,000 a month in rent and you, you know, the average daily rate is 180 bucks. You can't really make a spread that's profitable on that, even dedicated full time. So those buildings are just by nature going to be traditional full time residents. And then when they travel on the weekends or for the holidays, they'll monetize their home when, when they're away. We don't put caps in the activity. Um, we do create uh, modules and tools, revenue management tools for our residents so that they can, you know, uh, optimize their earning potential in, on peak seasons or peak weekends if there's a festival that's in town or, you know, uh, sporting events or any of that stuff. Um, so we give them the tools, but they really manage their calendar. Um, you know, we limit the number of units that any professional host could take in a building. And we also cap that, that allocated inventory. So we do our best to maintain inventory for traditional housing um, while still also affording the upside of, of the seasonal or, or peak season uh, revenue opportunities. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Um, Leo, how have your customer requirements changed over the course of the pandemic? We spoke about upgrades there. And have you noticed any significant differences between 
the different asset classes that you're active in. So you, your service departments, your your co living, and so on. Yeah, I guess the in the student accommodation part of our our uh, portfolio, uh, there's been significant changes in the usage uh, because of online learning and online teaching uh, and funnily enough the data tells a lot of stories the data for example microsoft teams takes more bandwidth than zoom would you believe and the and whether a college with the student village uh, if their, their policy is to use teams we're needing to give more bandwidth into the student villages around that college whereas it's not the same with zoom so it's all been really about bandwidth and making sure that the the connected network is able to cater for the increase in devices as well. So you've now got people, you can, you can see the, the students of today, they're on three devices at the one time. I don't know how they do it. I see my own kids, they're, they're uh, studying apparently with YouTube on another screen and Netflix on the third screen. And those, the amount of devices and usage in, in the student accommodation world uh, is very significant. But we're seeing that right through to the service departments world as well. Um, everybody now, you don't have to be kids to have two or three devices. Everybody now has two or three devices. So for us, it's making sure that someone in a, a rented apartment can roam their complex, can go down to the gym, can go to the, the co-working areas, can go to the amenities and stay connected with their devices. And a much more uh, campus-wide network is, is required. And it's something we've been pushing a lot in Build to Rent in particular. Um, I guess certain apartments in the past, particularly in Ireland, uh, the tenants were left up to their own devices and what internet connections they got. So what you were left with was various different connections right throughout the building. The minute you leave your apartment, you're disconnected and then you're on 4G or on your mobile. Whereas a much more centralized, managed connection network. Uh, and I think uh, that is now seen as more important than running water. Uh, at this stage, uh, and that has been because of the pandemic, for sure. Mm -hmm. And forgive me for being um, not very tech savvy at all, but how how easy is it to physically upgrade these properties and and, and, to, and to retrofit existing properties to, to the latest networks? Is it is it a, a very disruptive job? It's a lot easier than you think uh, because there has been the, the in the in the 2000s there was a lot of cable put into these buildings and a lot of cable you'll find cat5 data points in bedrooms and and living rooms and, and kitchens almost because everybody wanted to future proof and the reality is that those cables are no longer required but they are required to enable wireless within, a, within a, an apartment. So for example, if you have three or four traditional copper Cat5 cables in an apartment in various data points, we can easily intercept one of those and bring it back up and fit an access point. And that's all that's required. Once you have an access point in a, a, the optimum position within an apartment, apartment that will that will take like the, the access points the the enterprise standard access points that we put in we're a ruckus house they'll take 500 devices so th there's no there's no issue with, with connectivity then so a retrofit to a building like that is is no problem what we're seeing with the new builds is that we can now save uh, operators and developers a lot of money at the design stage by saying you don't need this cable you don't need that cable this is all that you need. Everything is wireless. Everything is going to go wireless. But as we all know, no matter how tech savvy we are, wireless is only wireless to the end users. So you want your iPad and your laptop and your TV to connect wirelessly. But in order to do that, it's heavily wired in the background. So a good fiber backbone throughout the complex, through the risers and the subcoms areas, uh, and then the the last mile can be copper. The last the last few meters can be copper. So a good fiber backbone, and that's easily retrofitted, um, and then uh, utilizing existing Cat5 cables into into various optimum locations around the building. Thanks, yeah. Okay, so before we get around to um, Q and A from the audience, 
Um, and please do submit your questions, folks, using the Q&A function. We we'll still have time. I just want to ask each of our three panelists in turn where they see their businesses three years from now and, and what the most significant learning from the pandemic period has been to, uh, to get them where, where they need to go. Um, Cindy, could we start with you, please, on that one? I think flexible living and office spaces and the sharing economy is just going to continue to grow. Um, you know, the consumer wants the product. They see the benefits from it. Uh, it enhances their quality of life. It provides more free time. It provides, you know, additional income potential from all these different channels. Um, so I think you're going to see critical mass adoption over the next five to 10 years. Um, right now, where in my world, home sharing is an amenity and it's kind of a novelty. I think it should be a standard where why can't you rent your place when you're not using it? Like there's absolutely no reason why that real estate couldn't be optimized. Um, it's just a, a, a long-term behavior change that is going to be impacted, you know, from the consumer level to the government agency level. And so that's a lot of layers for change. Um, but much like Uber, you know, the world wants it. They want it from the driver's perspective, from the user's perspective, you know, it's just a win-win for everybody. So I think, I think this sharing economy is going to apply to almost every facet of our life. Um, so COVID is, I believe, accelerated that adoption because the need for flexibility, um, not only in housing and accommodations, but also in your office space where you go, well, now I'm, now I'm working from home and my kids are working from home. Get me out of the house. Like, where can I go? Um, you know, when, when you don't return back to the office, but you still want some type of semblance or you, or you want to leave your home, you still want somewhere to go. Like, I think to Laszlo's point, it's a, a point of connection as communal areas. I'm tired of walking up and down the stairs and that being my entire day. You know, like you go, you go from your bedroom to your living room and you're in business. Um, and so I think all of these things, you know, are going to are going to get people more mobilized, more engaged um, and, you know, hopefully provide a better quality of living all around. But I think the sharing economy is going to continue to grow. I think, you know, the governments are going to regulate it to a degree where it makes sense. The pendulum is going to probably swing really hard one way and then it will come back to middle. Um, but the idea that whether you're a renter or you're an owner, um, you should have the right within reason to utilize your space um, is a concept that resonates and it's something that people want. And I think we'll continue that way. So it, it got accelerated and now a lot of users that might not have adopted, um, you know, co-working or co-living or, you know, flexible housing or any of those things are now much more inclined to use it, um, not only as a temporary solution, but as a long-term um, a solution for life. So I think it's all good for us. And specifically with regards to Orion House, you're, you're in the southeast of the US at the moment. Where do you see yourselves geographically three years from now? Geographically, we're working on licensing and franchise models to take this uh, business model and our, our software solutions internationally. Um, we do have relationships in Western and Eastern Europe, India, South America, Central America. So certainly from the, the developer's perspective, which is our main growth partner as real estate developers and, and REITs and family offices that hold a lot of this inventory, um, you know, I think it's gonna continue to grow. We won't likely leave the States as a company in the sense of having feet on the ground there, but we do wanna take our business model and, and be able to share it um, similar to how a hotel would flag, but just say, look, here's, here's how it works. Here's how you lease. Here's how you operate. Here's how you collect taxes. Here's how you remit taxes. Here's how you do your permitting. Like all of the logistical stuff of taking what is uh, traditional multifamily and combining that hybrid with hotel. Um, it, that's where the rubber meets the road. And so, you know, giving that playbook and licensing that out and uh, providing the supporting technology and integrations, I think, um, you know, that's where our future growth is. But as it relates to the U.S., you know, we look at, we look at the, the Southwest as our next geography that we'll be hitting. So um, Arizona, New Mexico, and California. Great stuff. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Laszlo, what, what's been your 
key learning from the pandemic and, and where do you see your company in three years time? Yeah, we've, we've, what we've seen as well is, is sort of a, this, you know, just the fact that I'm sitting here speaking on a webinar that's dedicated to hospitality, right? I mean, that kind of gives, gives part of the answer already. Like three years ago, these were very different industries and these were completely sort of separated silos. And, and today, you know, from the client perspective, they look at real estate as a service and it's, it's almost like in their heads sort of co-working, shared office space, co-living is just sort of this one big, big ball that they want to sort of explore and, 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 and get into. So, you know, we get a lot of requests from clients who are coming for office space, like, oh, you guys also have apartments. You guys have service, you know, like apartments for 60 of our, of our employees that are arriving next month in Lisbon, right? You get a lot of this. So I think there is going to be definitely like a lot of Conver continued convergence and ultimately right like in any industry there's going to be some consolidation there's going to be right like some brands who are going to prevail and 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 go international or even global so yeah and i think that's that's kind of what we see for ourselves as well I mean, we sort of started very small and very humble in in lisbon as i mentioned to you before the the call as well we, we've always looked at whatever we did every one of our units in and of itself had to be a uh, sort of viable business um, that's that's turning its own own profit so we never had the sort of megalomaniac again sort of venture capital fueled expansion of just gobbling off real estate for the sake of it um, and i think we'll continue to 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 grow that way but yeah there's a lot of opportunities that we are looking at some um some rural co-working for example in in portugal so there's definitely been a demand for that as well so post the pandemic i think everybody just wants more of the you know the seaside the mountains the lakes all of just reconnecting with nature and i think that's a really interesting opportunity and and portugal right everyone sort of thinks of it as the california of europe and there's just a lot of a lot of opportunities for that aren't yet 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 fully explored and then we are starting to look at some of those opportunities um and then you know the obvious sort of geographic locations of spain and france and potentially even london let's see there's some conversations but early days though so in an ideal world, what, what would be the top five locations on your wish list? Whew, I haven't thought about this one, but well, let me just improvise right now. I'd say, you know, Barcelona for sure. Maybe somewhere like, you know, Marseille along the south coast of France. Um, you know, Berlin because it's Berlin and London because it's London. And I think there is this sort of, you know, European synergy as well that we can tap into. There's a lot of people in London who would love to be, you know, sitting in sunny Lisbon right now and spend sort of a couple of weeks working out of here and, and have a network, have sort of a more European network that they can tap into both for, for co-working and for, for co-living solutions. Sounds pretty good to me right now, if you look at <laughs> well, we have got blue sky now. It's, uh, around the <laughs> um, Leah, where will IMS be in, in, in three years and what's the most important thing you've learned throughout the pandemic? Well, I think I'd like to be in the California of Europe. I haven't heard that, that expression before. Uh, Leslie, I'm coming to visit you soon. Um, yeah, to, to be honest, we, we, Portugal is an area actually that we're looking at projects uh, in the pipeline in Lisbon and Porto. So that's uh, with, with uh, two of our clients. Uh, the cities that, that Laszlo mentioned, we're, we've got properties in Berlin, London and Marseille. I haven't, haven't been to Barcelona yet, but uh, yeah, hopefully like the product, what we offer can be, can be uh, done in any, in any city in Europe. Uh, and so we intend to keep growing. We opened a London office recently, so, uh, and we keep, I, I guess we want to diversify our portfolio as well. And we see built to rent uh, and co-living and co-working uh, as future areas of growth for us uh, in parallel with the shorter let and the traditional hospitality and student accommodation markets. So uh, yeah, onwards and upwards, George. Thanks, Leo. Um, we've got a question in here for Cindy from Ernest Oriente. Thanks for your question, Ernest. And he asks, have you got any comments on extra costs, fees or deposits tied to inventory as a result of pandemic defaults? As a result of pandemic defaults, any extra costs, fees, deposits? It, not for us, you know, our business, because we don't have the master lease model, we didn't get in a situation of defaults. 
um, from either our renters because they're individual leaseholders and, and there were um, different financial instruments from the government that kept you know, their, their ability to pay. Um, but also as it relates to just extra cost fees or deposits for the short-term rental program, we don't have any upfront costs that are required. There is a 25% uh, fee that is paid out of the nightly rate to ownership and to our company from the management perspective, but that's only off of earned income from short-term rentals. So there's no additional cost to be a part of the program. Um, there's no additional fees or deposits, but if you earn, a portion of the revenue will stay with us to, to service the apartment and the building and the guest. And that's for fully serviced unit inventory. We do have a software solution where it's not fully serviced, which is a smaller portion of that income. Um, but if you, if you put your inventory into our home sharing pool and we run it entirely for you, there's a 25% commission on, on earned income on the nightly rate. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Uh, and thanks to uh, Laszlo and Leo also. For, it's been a really interesting session. Obviously, all three of our panelists coming from very different angles, but experiencing some uh, similar threads um, in, in driving and growing their businesses. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen for a moment just to show you guys a few slides before we wrap up. So our next Urban Living webinar is next Wednesday, the 17th, and the link to sign up for that is in the chat. And it's all about co-living. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject and it's um, one which is increasingly converging with other asset classes as we've heard from, from some of our speakers today. Now we've got a great live event taking place in Paris in January, uh, it's called Recharge. It moves around various European cities. Um, we've done them now in Amsterdam, Berlin, and Barcelona. Um, there's lots of information on the event website, which you'll see in the chat. Um, it's limited to 120 attendees. And it's a really interactive um, group of sessions about the convergence of hospitality and real estate asset classes. Um, it's a great event, it's really good fun. And, and people who come along, um, leave as friends and they really stay in touch. It's, it's a great uh, cooperative event. So um, do check that out. Uh, here are some of our sponsors for the event, as you can see there. If you're interested in taking part, please do get in touch with my colleague, Katie, whose contact details are there and also in the chat. And thanks for your time today. Thanks for watching. Um, if you're on any of these social channels, give us a follow and get involved. We're quite active on all of those. Um, and uh, thanks again to Laszlo, to Cindy and to Leo, to you guys for watching. Um, we're gonna leave the session open for a couple of minutes um, so you can take some notes from uh, all the information that's in the chat. Um, to our panelists, no need to stay on if you don't want to now or you can, or you can mute yourselves. Um, but if you need to get any of this info there, um, if not, I'll see you all soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much.